Hey, everybody. Welcome to Virtual Trek Con with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and we're just going to get to it. Super producer Brian Volkweiss is here, and we have so much to talk about. Um, basically, he does everything that you see on all of the streaming services that you love, and that's pretty much it, right? That's not true, but it does sound nice. I do it's like close. Hearing it. <laughs> You're very kind. Uh, a lot of Star Trek fans would know you from the center seat, uh, the 11 episodes uh, Star Trek docuseries that was awesome. I know a lot of people of this fans of the seventh rule were saying they especially loved how much uh, love and attention you gave to our very own Sirach Lofton, Jake Sisko, because it's tough. You got to figure out what you're going to focus on, what's going to follow the story. And uh, a lot of people were very appreciative of the work you did. Uh, it's, it's always great to hear that people love your work. But if there is anything I've ever made where it's even greater to hear it about your work, it it's the center seat. It It's my it's my baby. It's my baby. Yeah. And well, it's going to start of- being a lot wider. Uh, so it, it's going to be on more than just History Channel this year. So it, oh, cool. it should be everywhere uh, before the end of the year. So slowly but surely, as we start to get rights back, you'll see it on Pluto. You'll see it on Amazon. It'll to be <laughs> Roku, Peacock. So it'll it'll start to be everywhere. It'll be a lot easier to see. That's awesome. It'll be streaming live at Quark's Bar uh, anytime nice. soon. <laughs> <laughs> If you're weight staff. Yeah. So the way you um, said that, uh, sorry, I just want to ask real quick. The way you said that, Brian, it sounds like, is Star Trek your favorite or one of your favorite franchises? It's tied with Star Wars, but they're they're very different. Like, Star Wars inspired my career choice. Hmm. Star Trek... And again, I will just say, I know it's just a TV show and movies. I do know that. (laughs) But, um, I mean, it it basically gave me a code to live my life by. I'm not religious. I didn't, I wasn't in the military. So I didn't have like a a system to give me structure. And I was, I was uh, seven Wow. I was seven when I saw Wrath of Khan and that film for whatever. It's so funny. My daughter who just turned nine, she it's so interesting when you have kids because I'm seeing her do things that I did that I didn't realize it was a thing that I did it. But then I'm seeing my daughter do it in her own way. And for my daughter, it's Wednesday. Like she has watched that show. (laughs) bare minimum every episode 15 times could be 20 times and that's what i did with wrath of khan and that film you name it from not believing in no win scenarios like that's what changed my life that's what gave my life structure and then rumor has it they made more than just star trek 2 so everything that came <laughs> after continued to just give me reinforcement you know from picard to cisco to janeway um to the modern pike like that you see what i did there um that that's given me a structure by which i try to live my life Hmm. but those would be my top two tied for first place and speaking of that because you, you know you mentioned the structure and and kind of the life code um, and then the people that you mentioned were captains, you know, you said Picard and Cisco and Janeway. And my question, I guess, is, as more of an observation is, 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 is uh, the leadership skills that these captains show in the shows and the episodes and the movies, um, uh, are, are similarly applied in your own life when you are, a leader of a project in these projects that you put together. Mm-hmm. Is that the same kind of approach? You use those same skill sets? Yes. The simple answer is yes. The simple answer and the truthful answer is yes. But the more complicated, nuanced answer is I am a leader 
because I saw what they did and I wanted to be that. So, you know, I'll give you, I'll give, you know, with Kirk, like I said, that's where it all began for a long time, all through high school, all through college, at the beginning of my career, I was very Kirkian. But as I've gotten older, I find myself becoming more Picardian and Ciscoian. Did I make those words up? Um, no, those are definitely words. And, so, <laughs> like, you know, if you really think about it, the difference between, you know, I'll give you, you know, apples to apples, like when Kirk was losing, he blew up the enterprise. When Cisco was losing, he left a fucking baseball on a desk. Mm -hmm. Like, they both lost. They would both have... Am I allowed to curse, by the way? I forget. I think so. Yeah. All right. I'll try. I'll keep my cursing. <laughs> um, but they both lost. They both eventually won. But <laughs> Kirk blew up the Enterprise. He probably didn't have to. <laughs> and yeah. Cisco, in the most subtle FU in the history of television, just left a baseball on a desk from a conversation he'd had a couple years earlier. And yeah. like that to me, that's at this point in my life, if I acted like Captain Kirk, the company would be bankrupt <laughs> and, <laughs> and we'd probably be in jail. So it's not too applicable. It's not too great to be Kirk at the moment. Um, yeah. But being Picard or Cisco, that's what I think my job and my life requires of me now. And mm -hmm. it's not to say I don't still revere Captain Kirk, especially in Star Trek one through four, maybe skip five and then come <laughs> back on six. But not sure what was going on in five. But um, <laughs> I mean, actually, obviously, I know exactly what was going on. But my point is, it I don't lead because of them. Or I don't lead in a way because of what I learned from them. I sought to be a leader from a very early age because of what I saw them do. Mm -hmm. Right. And that leads to my next question, which is, what part of the process uh, when you're filmmaking is the part that you enjoy is it is it getting the actors together coming up with the concepts is it the actual shoot or is it the you know sitting back release is it dealing with the you know the networks and the big companies and getting these deals put together what what is the part of it that you enjoy i mean there's tons and tons of parts that i enjoy do you want me to tell you the number one best part yeah yeah it is this is one of the only things that a human being can do where you spend six months or a year or two years building something. And there's so many companies that do that. Millions of companies make products. But in entertainment, we're one of the only businesses that make a product that like if you work at Rolls Royce and you make engines for the 787 and the A350, you may have made an engine that is safely moving 50 million people a year mm -hmm. with staggering precision. It can it can work when it's negative 50 degrees. It can work when it's 200 degrees. It can work at 10,000 feet. It can work at 80,000 feet. And it, it's more fuel efficient than ever. Nobody knows what you've done. Mm -hmm. Everybody assumes the engine will work. The best thing about our business is like we make something that the public interacts with. And if they like it, like you're a, you're a part of society, like not society, but like you're a part of the conversation. I, I was in a, a used, um, bookstore a couple weeks ago and a book that we published last year i saw the book in the store and wow. my wife said to me um does it you know does it bum you out to see a book that you spent all this time and energy on is just sitting here you know it was 27 bucks brand new they were selling it for six bucks and she was like does that bother you and i'm like well until you asked uh <laughs> no but <laughs> 
the reason it doesn't, not only does it not bother me, it made me so happy because what it said to me was somebody paid 27 bucks for this book, their hard earned money. I don't know if they're minimum wage. I don't know if they're millionaires, but even billionaires are picky when they spend money. But also it was a book. So that means somebody spent their time on something that I helped be a part of. I didn't write the book. I had nothing to do with any of the creative. I met the author. I liked her. We did a deal with her and we published the book. That's all I did. But the fact that someone paid 27 bucks, finished it, and I you could tell it was read, and then gave it to a book, a used gift bookstore, and somebody else will buy it. Somebody else will read it. Hopefully, they'll bring it to a library or another used bookstore. That's all I ever wanted to do was, was be a part of this, to use some cheesy highfalutin term, I guess, like the national conversation or the global conversation. That's the best part of what I do is mm -hmm. just, you know, I'll get it. I get almost every day now a DM or something saying, I just saw this. And one of our shows just premiered in Australia. And all of a sudden, I'm getting all these people following me from Australia, DMing me. I love this. I love that. Even when they don't like what you're doing. It's like, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> unless they're being mean, which I have no tolerance for. But unless they're being mean, it's at least they're thinking about something we spent our time on, you know? I think the worst yeah. thing is to do something no one cares about. Right. Well, and you've got a lot of new projects coming up. Uh, speaking of Pike, coming down the pike. But before ah. we uh, announce a few of those, I just want to say where uh, you came into my national conversation. And that was a few years back. Uh, I went on to Netflix, a little website called Netflix. And there was this advertisement that said, the toys that made us. And I remember thinking, okay, I, you know, it's it's suggesting, and let me just click on it and just see what's what gives, you know. And I was freaking glued. I just wanted to learn. I didn't think that a docu series about toys, or what I thought was just a docu series about toys, would really be that interesting. But you really nailed that. It, it's more than just about the toys. It's about the zeitgeist of that era. It's about everything that went into those toys and what those toys then created and how that formed our thought processes and the conversation. There's just so much more to it. And of course, in uh, season two, you did one with Star Trek, you know, there were Star Wars ones that was, you know, I'm, I'm a sucker for He-Man. So I'm, so that was the one that got me. Uh, I was like, okay, I'll watch the He-Man. You could do a docu-series on He-Man and I will watch it. <laughs> Uh, but what was, did somebody pitch you that idea or were you the one that was like, or were you the one that actually said, all right, stay with me here. I want to do a bunch of episodes about different toys. And was it hard to convince people or were people like, yeah, I'm all for it. Uh, it was definitely my idea, but it's always a stupid thing to say no one has an idea to make a documentary about toys, or I would argue a billion people did before me. So the idea wasn't, but yes, it was my idea. Uh, it took seven years to sell, came very wow. close at History Channel, very close at Net Geo, literally budgeting con contracts, and then for two different reasons, fell apart both times. Um, and then the luck, it was the luckiest, it changed my entire life. Uh, there was a guy mm -hmm. at Netflix, literally just had lunch with him today, a guy named Devin. I'm not supposed to say last names because then they get a billion emails. Uh, but a guy named Devin, <laughs> um, I knew him because my company also does a lot of stand-up comedy specials. So right. he was the guy in charge of acquiring stand-up specials for Netflix. So one day he called me up and he was like, hey, man, I, I'm now running unscripted for Netflix. Do, do you have any ideas? How many producers get asked that question by a network? <laughs> they I'm dream like, of it. Believe it or not, I do. So I sent him the deck that we had developed for History Channel, which was called The Toys That Made America. Hmm. Actually, it was called The Toys That Built America. Sound familiar? And um, that 
he called me up one day and even this conversation changed everything. He said, and by the way, the picture, the deck, the, the picture, just to show you how different this version was, the, the image on the cover of the deck was that famous picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware, except all the heads of the people on the boat were replaced with famous toy heads. Nice. So George Washington was Optimus Prime. The guy rowing in the back was the Baroness. So that's the <laughs> show, that was the show I originally had conceived. Yeah. What yeah. Devin said to me in that first call after he had read the deck was, the show that Netflix would do would be like your idea meets that 70s show. To which, of course, I said to him, what the hell are you talking <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> this yeah. is what he said. And this, by the way, everything we do ties into this thing he said to me, which was, Netflix considers that 70s show to be the perfect show. Here's why. The cast is very young and good looking. That gets young people. The era mm -hmm. is the 70s. That gets old people. So we made a new deck and a new sales tape that completely changed what the show would have been for the History Channel or Nat Geo. That's what got greenlit. And that's what you saw. And mm. in my opinion, I don't know if other people would agree with this or not, but in my opinion, that's what everything we've done from movies that made us to behind the attraction at Disney Plus to the center seat, Icons on Earth, Toy Store Near You, that's what they all have in common. We're making them for, and this is really from my point of view, what we do that's so hard. And I'm not saying we always get it right, but at least we try is we're trying to make the show for two audiences that are in direct conflict with each other. Mm -hmm. And the best way I can explain it is when I saw the JJ 2009 movie, a girl who worked for me had a friend at Paramount who got literally a four month early screening of the movie because the movie had been pushed back. I forget why. So I go with her, you know, she's this girl I work with, you know, I'm her boss. And we're sitting in the theater, and within three minutes, I am fuck. I'm sorry, I am bawling my eyes out, and I'm embarrassed. I'm with this girl I work with, you know, whatever. From that, I, from that opening scene. From that opening scene. By the way, I was amazing. crying the whole movie. Crying the whole movie, not just that scene, but I cry a lot in movies. So I'm literally sitting there crying, trying to like hide my face. I don't want her to see me crying. By the way, this girl zero point zero interest in Star Trek. <laughs> the only reason she was there was because she had to be there to get me in. I was her plus one. So I'm like kind of hiding. So I take a little look at her to see if she's seeing me crying. She's crying too. And that's what makes that movie so good. And that's what we try to do. I hope if somebody has a spouse that's not a Trekkie, at the very least, they enjoyed Center Seat, watching it with their spouse that does love Star Trek. But maybe that our show, maybe our show helped the non-Trekkie spouse understand a little bit better the Trekkie spouse. Mm -hmm. And I do believe I invented that right now. Trekkie spouse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like the idea behind that. Um it's really um, gets your audience as big as possible, mm -hmm. um, you know, because, you know, usually you work in demographics with uh, the business. They're like, oh, the 18 to 35 and the this and that. And they always breaking down demographics, you know, um, men over 60, this and that. And I think that you widen your range when you do that, when you make something that you don't even have to be a fan of the thing to like it. That That's when it transcends whatever it is. That, mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And the way you do that as a filmmaker is when you're doing a documentary, there's a billion stories you can tell. But 
if you pick the stories that tell your story, but also speak to any race, age, any race, any sex, that so I mean, like as if you saw the first episode of Center C, you know we folk, and this was a lifelong thing that drove me crazy was Lucille Ball not getting any credit. So that was something I wanted to do for decades. But if you really think about it, male, female, black, white, straight, gay, whatever, anybody can get, anybody can relate to getting screwed. Mm -hmm. Anybody can relate to not getting credit when you work hard. Anybody can relate to not getting the money. And again, Lucille signed a contract. That's why she didn't get paid. She has nobody to blame but herself. But still, you feel bad for someone that sold something for a million dollars that now generates, two, you know, quarter billion a year. Like that sucks for her and her offspring. So yeah. for me, that was a perfect Star Trek story, but it was also a human story that any human being can relate to. Elon Musk, one of the richest people alive doesn't need charity, doesn't need help, nothing. But I guarantee you, he can still relate to watching this woman almost 100 years ago not get any credit mm. for creating... Not, and by the way, it's not just Star Trek. It's also Mission Impossible. Uh, this woman single-handedly created Paramount's two most valuable IPs. Nobody <laughs> knows. And th that's what we try to do. Yeah, yeah. The human stories uh -huh. for sure. I mean, I'm right when you said everybody knows what it's like to get screwed or not not get the uh, the uh, flowers that you deserve or the credit that you deserve. I know it. I thought it. Every, everybody thinks that when you said it, we go, "Oh yeah, I I know that." Yeah, <laughs> it but doesn't usually, who you for, are. yeah, but for us, it usually happens for like you know your job, your boss takes credit for some idea at work, totally. and, and and it you get robbed of that moment. You don't get robbed of billions of dollars, right? So it's like she when it happens robbed. on that kind of scale. Yeah. I don't know. Every she drunk guy really at the bar luck. says that they did. Every drunk at the bar is like, I had a billion dollar idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, and I was this. Exactly. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> but just to be clear, she didn't get robbed. She right. just well, said, no, really she didn't get robbed. robbed. She right. had bad luck. The syndication wasn't a thing when mm -hmm. she did the That's deal. Cool. Not to mention, I'm pretty sure that she didn't think it would be what it became i mean it no became one. yeah nobody could have thought that no except for george except for george lucas who did think that when he got the toy rights and the merchandising rights in the original star wars but, uh, but, yeah. but there's a very famous picture of him and gene roddenberry talking yep. at a new york comic-con and oh. from all the research we did on icons on earth star wars Toys that made us Star Wars and the center seat. Mm -hmm. It is very clear a tremendous percentage of that conversation was about the ancillary rights. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. And don't forget, Star Wars is t almost to the day 10 years younger than Star Trek. Yeah. Not the day, the month. It, it's like 68 days off of 10 years exactly. So Gene Roddenberry was giving George Lucas the game. Is that what yeah. was happening? Yeah. He, if you look at what Gene quote unquote got wrong, and I would argue he didn't get anything wrong. He just, no one cared about got... Larry back then. So mm, the right. whole thing that he did with Lincoln M Enterprises, which to this day is legally dubious. Anyone at Roddenberry Entertainment would tell you it's a gray area. Anybody at Paramount would tell you it's a gray area. If they went to court, both sides do not know what the outcome would be. And that's why they've agreed to continue working together in this gray area. But it's a gray area. Whereas mm -hmm. when George Lucas did his deal with Fox, there was nothing gray about it. Right. Now, you wow. mentioned uh, in all of that uh, icons unearthed uh, and all of the radical uh, I guess research. It sounds like you're just extremely researched in all of these projects that you do. Uh, Icons unearthed, um, currently running season three. But 
What is season four going to be? Season four is not just Marvel movies, but it is every season is six episodes. Uh, Marvel is eight. So it's a supersized season. <laughs> we because we need more of that. I'm a That's big right. Marvel yeah. head. I'm a big, you know, Marvel guy. DC less. For some reason, Marvel was just the one that grabbed me as a kid and DC less. Do you have a preference or are you legally obligated to say Marvel right now? I don't know. I can, I can say it. <laughs> um, it's funny. I, I, there's, there's only one superhero for me and, and that's Batman. Hmm. Every other superhero to a certain degree is on the same level. Like if you look at my toy collection, I have a gigantic, it's probably the second or, th well, it's probably the third or fourth biggest genre of my collection is Batman. Wow. So, I mean. See, it's crazy. I look at, I look at DC Marvel, like for me, DC was like IBM and using Microsoft and Marvel was like the iPhone, the Apple. It was just yeah. like clean, easy, user-friendly, I, I, you know. And and to me, that's that was the difference. So I gravitated more towards Marvel and X Men and you know P Punisher and whatnot more so than even though I did have the Batman's uh, and a few of the other stuff, but mostly was Marvel for me. Yeah, I I didn't get into either, and the the only reason just to turn this into a therapy session. The only reason <laughs> why I got into Batman was I got mugged in the seventh grade and it was obviously very scary at knife point and everything. And um, I just so who literally was a 12 year old. <laughs> yeah, no, it was, well, that's New York, baby. Uh, Yikes. So it, I just gravitated towards Batman after that. And, but, and never, give me, give me never, a backpack and your juicy and your little juicy <laughs> box. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I, they they scared. They changed the course of my life for wow. uh, about a uh, probably thirty dollar jacket. Yeah. Jesus. Wow. So then that's so then you like the idea that Batman was kind of like. See, I, I I gravitated to Punisher for those same reasons. Hmm. I thought Punisher was the guy who was going to pay back. He was going to get the ultimate payback. Um, and so Batman was your payback guy. Yeah. He. Um, it's so funny. The police found the people who mugged me, but my mom, right or wrong, we'll never know, made the decision not to press charges because she was like, if we press charges, then they'll probably beat up Brian as soon as they get out of jail or worse. And again, in retrospect, I don't know, maybe that was the right thing to do. Even if she was wrong, her heart was in the right place. But as right. a 12, 13 year old, you just want justice. Mm -hmm. And Batman was dealing out justice every 30 <laughs> minutes. And that's, but my point is, I've, when, I, when I saw Iron Man, when I saw Thor, that's when I learned who they were. I had no idea who they were. I never read an Iron Man comic, never read any of those things. So I've been learning through, and that's true of every character except Batman. Wow. Uh, yeah. So when you um, when you do this uh, icons on Earth, how much of it is going to be the comic versus how much is it going to be the the movies? So the first episode is basically from the founding of Marvel until literally the green light of Iron Man. Wow! Then the second episode is Iron Man, and we go all the way through Ant Man. Okay. I had the pleasure and privilege of meeting Stan Lee at a convention. Uh, and this was like so, I, I guess it was so long ago that he didn't even have a line or like it wasn't, there was like no crowd there. And I remember I walked right up to his table, introduced myself. Uh, it was like the a treasured moment in my wow. life having shook Stan Lee's hand and, and just knowing how much how much money I gave him buying all of these comics <laughs> that I still have to this day sitting in boxes. So uh, I was just so grateful to have met him. Uh, Stan, Stan Lee obviously could be heavily 
featured in this, right? Or- yeah, he's he's all over it. But by the way, you know what's funny, man? You just reminded me of this. I've never even said this out loud before. In 90, either it was 98 or 99, in Pasadena, I went to a convention. Second convention I ever went to ever. And Will Wheaton, it was the most sad thing I've seen in my life. I mean, he... <laughs> I, he had maybe one person come by in 20 minutes. I saw the I same saw, thing. I saw, him at, I saw him at a convention last year. It must have been 80 to 90 people waiting yeah. for him to sign their... Yeah. Uh, you know what changed head. that? Because I, I saw that at a Star Trek Las Vegas, which was the biggest Star Trek convention in the world several years ago. And I remember looking and he was just by himself and he smiled and like waved and he was very friendly. Uh, and there was nobody at his tables and nobody at his table. And it was so strange. And then he just blew up. And I, yeah. you know, I think that's from the tabletop gaming. I think that's where, you know, he started that or he worked on that. And then that just put him in a completely different level. Now he's, you know, this huge, uh, huge guy. You're not going to see nobody at his lines anymore at his table anymore. Yeah. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah, no, it's 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 unreal. I, That's why I couldn't color. believe Stan Lee. I couldn't believe seeing Stan Lee sitting yeah. there, like looking for somebody to talk to him. Like, uh, I guess I'll talk to my you. Chance, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've met him a few times over the years, usually in green rooms and stuff. And that, that, that guy's a trip. I mean, mm. he is what you think he is. I mean, he's a high end. I, I met him probably he was in his late seventies the first time I met him. The last time I met him, he's probably in his mid 80s. He, he had the energy of a 25 year old. Mm-hmm. So, Brian, you're also the man behind a toy store near you. Uh, you're working on a, a new season for that. Yeah, we're actually doing two seasons. Uh, wow. For whatever reason, we always get picked up in two season uh, in intervals. So, yeah, so we're in post right now on season six. And in production on season seven. And we are doing, we can't guarantee anything, but we are trying very hard to get both out this year. And as oh. of now, we're on schedule. Wow. Knock on wood there. I've got I've got a toy store uh, story. Toy store story. Uh, Michael Jackson. I met Michael Jackson. I didn't meet him. I saw him at a toy store in Beverly Hills. Uh, I was going to pay my phone bill. And I see a crowd gathered in front of the toy store. And I'm like, what do you guys, you know, what's going on? They're like, Michael Jackson's in there. And of course, I joined the crowd like, well, he is. We'll move out of the way. Give me a spot. <laughs> and I stood there, waited for him to come out. He was there with uh, his you know, prince and blanket. But he came out, walked past everybody, took a couple of photographs, you know, and that's my toy store story. story. Right. Tell but you, what, what, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, tell me one of yours. Tell me one of yours. Well, no, I was going to tell you my Michael Jackson story. Oh, okay. <laughs> this is like 2006 or 2007. I used to be a manager, and I uh, one of my clients was gigantic. He was a stadium, uh, an arena stadium act. Big, big success. And uh, we were at, we I believe, I'm 99% sure, the United Center in Chicago. and. You know, normally when you're doing these shows, you're there all day. It's the most boring thing in the world. You're walking around this giant, famous arena with nobody in it. You know, it gets a little weird, whatever. And I had been there all day. And then one day I came out of my uh, little office area and I literally thought like Obama was in the building. Like I literally thought it was him because he was the president and we were in Chicago. There was... What looked to me like secret service at every, you know, the way these arenas work, if you've never been backstage, they're in these kind of circles of like security. So you're in the outer ring, then the inner ring, and then you can enter the thing. And there was a guard at every single door between the outer ring and the inner ring. Mm. And like literally did a 360 around the whole United Center. And finally, when I got back to the production office, I'm like, and, and before I could finish it, they're like, Michael Jackson's here. <laughs> I never saw him, but yeah, he, he was checking out the venue for a tour. He ultimately, unfortunately, never did. But 
it literally created like a bubble around him. And like, even though we had paid for the building, we had every legal right to go wherever we wanted. They kept us in the outer ring for almost an hour <laughs> while he walked around. Yeah, it was wild. I mean, it was uh, two dozen security people covering two dozen doors. Well, I can say that the time that I saw the crowd, it was maybe 15 or 20 people outside. Within 10 minutes of me standing there, there were 500 to 1,000 yeah. of us. And not, and not only that, but the police were joining in. So the police were like, hey, what the hell are you guys doing? <laughs> and then the police would be, <laughs> the police started parking their their cars and jumping out. Oh, well, yeah. And they're joining in. Yeah, so I it just that. became like a cluster. Like there, there was, everybody was out of control. Um, just to catch a five second glimpse of him walking from the front door to his car. And it was, it was worth the wait. For worth me. it. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, worth it. yeah, no, that that would be worth it. Mm -hmm. It's worth it. I mean, I I love his music. Obviously, he's a he's an icon um, on Earth, or who was on Earth. <laughs> mm -hmm. He he was kind of. I mean, not to get too yeah. sidetracked, but you know, he was kind of the icon before you know all, everything kind of blew up. You know, in the but, last twenty years, it, it, w what's a toy store near? you about though is that is it about the toy stores themselves yeah it's it's a really crazy story um during covid all these toy stores were they all believed they were going to go out of business so you know we were a production company and i was like what can we do to help these stores so i was like well maybe we could you know my whole company is working from home we didn't know what was going to happen either. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I called a friend of mine who owns a toy store in Portland, Billy Galaxy. And I was like, I'm just curious. If we gave you a list of shots and a list of questions to ask your staff and your customers, do you think you could film it and send it to us? And he was like, yeah. So we asked four other stores. They all said yes. Not one person said no. and. Yeah. That's what happened. We made we made this basically unwi unwittingly. We made a pilot with Billy Galaxy's store, and it was all about how his store was dealing with COVID. I sent that to every network that I know. Amazon yeah. loved it, and they greenlit it um, for one season of five episodes. Yeah, that's what we did. It was five stores. They shot everything themselves with iPhones. I did not realize that. Oh. Wow. And um, and basically, it was a huge, huge hit. The majority of the profit goes back to the stores. And the at marketing for the, for the show is very helpful for the stores. I, mm -hmm. I do believe the stores care more about that than they do about the money they get every quarter. But yeah. um, it was a huge hit. And Amazon picked up season two and three. Then they picked up season four and five, and now they've picked up season six and seven. Are and, you still uh, shooting that remotely? Like, are they still shooting it for you, or did you it, break it the mold? It used to be 100% the stores did it themselves. Now it's about 75%. Oh, still a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. They do. They absolutely do the vast, vast majority. Yeah. That's amazing. It just sometimes there's certain things that I get a little artsy fartsy about and like, I want to send a drone or just something and we get involved a little bit, but it's, it's primarily the stores. And the funny thing is like, it's so funny. I was at LAX a couple months ago flying with a pretty famous person to go shoot something. And this kid comes up to us and he was like, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, and I was like, and the person I was with was like, Oh no, no, it's okay. I wouldn't be here without the fans. And he <laughs> looked at her and was like, who are you? <laughs> and he was like, uh, he was like, he looks at me and I'm like, oh, and then I looked at the star and I go, oh, just so you know, we do this show called The Toys That Made Us. And the kid goes, wait, what's The Toys That Made Us? And I go, wait, what? how do you know me? He's like, a toy store near you. Nice. So now wow. that's becoming a bigger thing for us than even toys that made us was, which 
that would possibly be, I've had no bigger surprise in my career than what I just said. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. The wow. Toy store, the toy store uh, show is, is, is getting more, notor- more notoriety than the toys it made of. It's a great idea. It's super fun. Yeah, it's very I was simple. that, I was that kid once, by the way, when I was like, Oh, Hey, Terry Hatcher. Yeah. But, you and I was totally into Baron Davis, the basketball player, but she thought that, but anyway, that's just my high school. Ryan would have kicked me yeah. so hard for that. Uh, but it's true. <laughs> Baron Davis, you know, love the guy. Um, but here's something I didn't know anything about. And maybe some people uh, watching or listening in do something called robo force. I didn't know it. The picture looks a little familiar. Right now, everybody watching, check this out. Does this ring a bell here? And I know a lot of people are going to say, oh, yeah, we know this one. Uh, Wrecker, this one looks like his name is Max. Ah, It looks familiar. Did they also have a cartoon or were they only a toy line? They technically had a cartoon, but the cartoon, while the pilot was being finished, uh, got canceled. Mm. It, it's it's one of the biggest disasters in the history of the American toy business, maybe the world toy business. Wow. Its failure bankrupted the company that made it. Um, it's a very interesting story. And we incorporated the story of its actual failure into the actual story we're using. We're, we're making the cartoon right now, six episodes. So okay. the, the actual story, basically what happened if you don't mind, but because I love telling the story. Um, CBS bought this medium-sized toy company called Ideal uh, because CBS was tired of hiring these toy companies that made all the money from their own IP. So they bought Ideal, and after they bought the company, they said, come and pitch us your big ideas. So Ideal pitched the head of CBS, and the head of CBS said, We are CBS, and we care about two things, grand slams and home runs. Everything you just pitched is singles and doubles. We don't care about Mm -hmm. singles and doubles. Come back in a month and pitch us a grand slam. So this small, medium-sized toy company scratched their heads and came up with this thing called RoboForce. Most toys launch with seven characters. They launched with 32 characters, two vehicles. Uh, most, most lines don't even launch with any vehicles. They launch with two vehicles. Um, every kind of consumer product you can think of, bed sheets, spoons, pillows, snow Spoon. shovels. They even in 1983 were selling a $2,000 robot that looked like the lead character whose name at the time was Max Steele. Okay, this is a giant size one, right? Was the, it? the the main one was like this big. The yeah, giant one the, was like three feet tall. Yeah, I think that's what I've seen. I've seen that giant robot at a collector store, like an antique vintage collector store. I've seen the giant. Yeah. So at Toy Fair, which is like the big toy event of the year up until today, like it's still it's still going on. Um. They announced on Tuesday this whole thing. They did this gigantic, crazy presentation. Everything was crazy. They got a 2 million unit order from Toys R Us, uh, the biggest order in the history of Toys R Us that never was broken, Uh, a half million dollar order of units, not dollars, units from KB, the best, literally the best day in the history of Toy Fair, what they bought. That was on Tuesday. Can you guess what was announced on Thursday? Oh, no. Bankruptcy. (laughs) I think that was Saturday. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Tell me. Tell me. Something called, tell me if you've heard of it, Transformers. I I, I had a feeling that's what you were going to Yeah, 1983. Yeah. That was also He-Man was around then. But yeah, Transformers is just going to kill that the toys r us order went from two million units to a hundred thousand units 
The KB order went from half a million to 25,000. Um, they lost everything. And then CBS, even though CBS told them to do it, CBS literally spun it off and sold it into bankruptcy. So we bought that copyright uh, about a year and a half ago. And the toys, oh, the boy. product placement, that's Wrecker. So when you showed up that thing before, the little yellow guy, this is what our version looks like. And our cartoon is based on the newer version. And we incorporated that story into the cartoon. So even if you read the back of the box, now that I told you what really happened at Toy Fair, even though the show takes place about 110 years from now, that yeah. story is the bedrock of our story. Oh, that's so cool. And I, and I can already see, and you know, you don't have to worry about giving me anything for this one. This is a freebie. <laughs> I can, Ciroc's I, I can freebie. Al- <laughs> freebie, yeah. I can already see RoboForce versus Transformers coming out one of these days. It would oh, be the like greatest Alien irony. versus Predator? <laughs> yeah, it would be the greatest irony, you know, ever, actually, mm. um, for that to happen. But that's really cool. So what was the um, uh, the main idea for updating and changing the, the way that the robots looked? I mean, obviously it's updated because it's not 1983 anymore, but what what made you come to that, you know, the look? You know, again, man, like I, all I can do is trust my gut. And I just remember even as a kid looking at these things being like, this is really unique. But it has no legs. How <laughs> can it walk? How can it kick? Right. It has a <laughs> suction cup. And that was the main design change. I drew a sketch, which I basically, I took what it had been. And that like, if you show the record picture again, you'll see his chest looks like this guy's chest, but right. you'll see his eyes look the same, but we just built out everything else. So like you can see in ours, same exact chest. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. you can't really see the feet, but our feet also have real. Hang suction. on, hold that, hold that up again. Sorry. Yeah. There we go. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and that's probably one of the main reasons. Like you know, when I was playing with toys, I wanted the Voltron, the Transformer toy because they did have legs and arms, and you could put stuff. <laughs> yeah, in that, their that's hands. why you're like, I need toys with legs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 subconsciously yes i did exactly I subconsciously walk. it's i made them walk i made them hold weapons i mean th- mm-hmm. that was part of the whole imagination like the battle scenes and stuff like that yeah. the no legs I, thing I, would be a tough sell but i just remember this to your question great question my design philosophy that i gave to our designers that i mean literally i had a a, a graphic made that I gave to all of our designers. And, you know, we're doing this now with multiple IPs. You know, we bought Biker Mice, we bought Sectors, we bought Gar- the great Garlu, and we're combining them all. But the design, press, whatever it is, the, the thing yeah. I told them to use was, it's I had them side by side, the deflector dish from the 60s Enterprise, and the deflector mm. dish from the Enterprise refit in the motion picture. Because what it did brilliantly was it you, you knew it was the same ship. But when they were designing it in the 50s, it, sorry, in the 60s, satellite dishes were a big deal. But by 1975, 1976, when the movie was getting made, satellite dishes were kind of old school antiques. Mm. So instead of making a brand new enterprise that looked ridiculous, it basically looked the same shape wise, but they got rid of the satellite dish and just said this big glowing blue thing that could be anything. So even though it's 2023, 57 years from when the show premiered, we still don't know what that blue stupid thing is, but it doesn't (laughs) look, I mean, we know what it does, you know, it pushes away (laughs) space dust or whatever, but you know what I'm saying? Like it was a perfect design choice 
because what worked in 1979 still works in 2023 because it was kind of vague. And that's how we did this, where we took things that were undeniably RoboForce and we kept them, like his eyes and his face, but Chest. everything else changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we only have a, a minute or two left. Uh, oh. By the way, this that that RoboForce hey, toy looks Ryan, we lost weird. you there. <laughs> I'm oh, really? He's still there. You can't hear me? Yeah, there you go. Now okay. I was just saying that uh, that RoboForce toy looks freaking amazing. I love it. Um, yeah. Real quick, we only have a minute or two left. You mentioned biker mice from Mars. Two quick things. One, RoboForce, when's that coming out, if there is any kind of date? Uh, and secondly, if, tell us about biker mice, if you can say anything. If we stay on schedule, RoboForce should be coming out the very, very end of 2023 or the very beginning of 2024. Um, and then, um, biker mice, we, the toys will be coming out this summer. So they're, they're already in pre-pro and all that. I mean, they're in production right now in China. Mm -hmm. Um, the show, uh, we just attached, uh, the, one of the biggest celebrities alive. Um, I can't say who yet. And, um, that'll be announced hopefully in the next month or two. And then that, that will enter production soon after that and again like i said we're merging the ips so when you're watching robo force there's a scene in a bar and there's signs all over the bar that say no mice so like that's no basically <laughs> robo force okay. exists in the same world as biker mice which exist in the same world as sectors and power lords and the great garlu and in case you or any of your listeners have never heard of any of these ips a, it doesn't hurt my feelings. B, I'm not surprised. <laughs> C, yeah. we don't have the money yet to be trying to buy Transformers. So right. we've been, you know, getting the IPs that we can afford, and then we're combining them so that each series builds off, build helps build all of them. There's this company you may have heard of called Marvel that seemed to have done this pretty well. Um, and that's so we're looking at for ourselves. We call it the Nacelleverse because we're egomaniacs. <laughs> the cell company. Uh, you have the best job ever, by the way, Brian. Uh, yeah. I think you've just proven that uh, over the course of this discussion. Like any job is good days and bad days, but there have been more good days and bad days lately. Knocking on wood. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be looking that. for the... Oh, what? <laughs> I'm looking forward to the Biker Bites from Mars merchandise. Like one of their uh, their t shirts and something. Uh, that looks like it's going to be some cool product line right there. Uh oh, it looks yeah, like I'll he's pulling something up. up. Yeah, this was this morning. That's what's called the paint. The paint master. The yeah. factory sent us that. That's the lead. That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's all coming. Yeah, I watched Biker Mice tomorrow. I mean, I remember it. When it was on television, I, I watched the show. So uh, that one I'm probably more familiar with than all of the other um, intellectual property we're talking about part of the universe. But um, I'm looking forward to seeing this stuff because of one thing I know, mm -hmm. you know toys, you know uh, the animation history. So, I mean, you're going to bring that level of quality, that, that, that um, amount of research that you've done and, you know, going around gathering all of this information i'm looking forward to that seeing that apply in your toys and in your uh mm -hmm. your interpretation of this intellectual property so i, I think it's going to be spectacular mm -hmm. yeah i think Knock the fans wood, uh, we don't mess it up i think the fans really can trust you with these ips because it, yeah. it's you, you've shown the passion and the knowledge and the creativity for it so you're you're taking these IPs and bringing them to new heights, which is kind of what you did with those toy stores. You know, you you get things that people love, and you you allow them to flourish. You take them to these new heights. And I think that's just one of the coolest things anybody can do. And uh, second to saying yes when we ask you to come on our show, uh, Brian. This has been so much fun. We really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. And as I said to you before, it's always a yes. Just tell me when.
That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> because you got a lot of things coming out. So we want to keep talking no, about man, it. I just, I, yeah. it's, still, it's still hard to believe anyone even cares to talk to me about anything like this. So I'm very grateful. Hmm. Absolutely. So we're, we're happy to have you uh, and wish you so much continued success. Thanks, I man. mean, you know, you've already won Grammys, Emmys. It's just, it's just a matter of time before you continue to, you know, you're just going to keep doing it. So I'm, I'm here to support you all the way. And we haven't even touched all the stand-up comedy that you are a part right, of. We'll have to do that, that next, yeah, that's like a whole next time. Nice we're going to have to yeah, get yeah, on we that. We all got to go. Next so time. much. Yeah, that's a whole uh, other show. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much, uh, Brian, and everybody at home. Thank you for joining us. And enjoy Virtual Trek Con. And go check out Biker Mice from Mars. But uh, I think Robo Force is the one that I'm super excited about right now. <laughs> See you next time. Thank <laughs> you.